Breath of Life presents Relentless Pursuit with Pastor Walter L. Pearson, Jr. First Kings chapter 19 is where I would like to direct your attention. I believe that we have been blessed all week long. What do you say? I think I promised you at the beginning I'd have fun all week long. I have. <laughs> I don't know what God has done for you. I, I hope you've been blessed. But uh, whenever I open this book, something happens to me. And uh, I, I count it a privilege to have the opportunity to share it with you. First Kings chapter 19 and I direct your attention to verse 7. 1 Kings chapter 19, starting with verse 7, and here's what the Bible says. And the angel of the Lord came again the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for thee. And he arose and did eat and drink and went in the strength of that meat forty days and forty nights unto Horeb, the mount of God. And he came thither unto a cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him and said unto him, What doest thou here, Elijah? I borrowed the words. What doest thou here? Shall we pray together? Father in heaven, we are so grateful for the truth that is in the Word of God. Our minds are bombarded all day long, every day, with things that are not true. But when we open this book, we are assured that this is the truth. We also have the assurance that the one who guided in the writing of the book can be with us and give us the power to understand and to comprehend. Be with us tonight. Give us that power, and we shall give praise, glory, and honor to thy name. In the name of Jesus, we pray, amen. The Bible is clear. There is, there is a time when God directs, when God tells you where to go. And I have determined by experience and by what I've read that if God says go and you do it, you can be certain that he will be with you. There is a wonderful feeling when you know that God is with you. You remember that the disciples were on that trip. I have preached about it a few times when Jesus said go and the storm arose, but somebody remembered that when Jesus goes with you, you need not be afraid of storms. If there is divinity, on the trip with you, uh, you have a different level of security. Uh, when you begin to read about Elijah, particularly as we begin in verse 17 of First Kings, uh, he is not announced as many prophets are. There are prophets who came with a long description of who they were, their forebears and uh, their credentials. Elijah comes with not a lot of fanfare. In fact, when you find him at the beginning of uh, chapter 17, he is directed to go to the palace of King Ahab and Queen Jezebel. Forgive me if when I say that, that double name, that those people who became a couple, forgive me if I tremble a little bit. Ahab and Jezebel. But if God tells you to go see him, you ought to go see him. Because a visit in God's name ought bring no fear. So Elijah shows up uninvited. I'm sure there was somebody to greet him at the palace door and to ask, who are you? Do you have an appointment? You look strange. You're dressed like the prophets of old. What, what brings you here? And he skips past all the normal chit-chat and goes directly to the king and queen and says there will be no rain until I bring you the word from God. 
the heavens will be sealed up like brass there will be nothing to water your crops you are about to see a change that you cannot expect and I declare it to you by the Word of God and and just as quickly as he came he was gone uh, there might have been some response from Ahab there certainly would have been a response from Jezebel she probably would have started by giving a critique on his wardrobe but before she could talk about what he wore he was gone Ahab probably would have asked, in whose authority do you come? But when you come in the power of God, you don't need to explain. So he says what God says for him to say, and then he disappears. He came in the power of God. There was no question that he had authority. He got in. He got to the right people. He delivered the message, and he was gone. It sounds like a great sermon. Get in. Speak up get out so now he's gone and I want to make the point to say that he came because God directed him and every time Elijah moves when God directs you can be sure that God will be with him in fact when the effects of this drought began to show up uh, one of my favorite writers says that when Elijah went to the palace to tell the king there will be no more rain it took a lot of faith because as he traveled he passed by well watered places he passed by little bodies of water that were poetic as they traveled he passed by trees that were verdant and spreading he passed by flowers that grew by themselves he passed by places that said everything except there'll be no more rain but my friends, if God declares something, you don't need evidence from nature. God is above nature. So when he declares it, you don't need evidence. Just say what God says. After that happened, they began to see immediately what God had promised. It doesn't take long for, uh, for nature to respond to an imbalance of this sort. Uh, when you get to the place where you are responsible for a lawn I, I prayed and prayed and prayed that I would have a lawn you know that's one of the American dreams that you will have a house and and a little lawn not too much you don't want too much because then you've got to get a tractor you've got you've got to call in help but just enough and when I was finally responsible for a lawn I began to to determine something that if rain is not regular if there if there isn't support for the lawn you can soon become the neighbor that is hated people pass down the street and they look at all the rest of the lawns and you know some people are quite ostentatious not only do they have a wonderful lawn but they put little object d'art out on the lawn and uh, they make it so pretty. They got things that sparkle and things that look like they were bought in uh, European places. And, and there you are with a lawn that's beginning to turn the wrong color. A and I've become quite sensitive to what it takes to keep a lawn looking good. My lawn is nothing compared to the landscape that began to turn brown that began to lose its burden say when God said I will seal up the sky <laughs> I will seal it up like brass I lock up the heavens so that a drop of water can't get through brass some people tell me is still uh, the metal you want to use to convey liquid God says I'll seal up the heavens so there will be no conveyance of liquid and very soon you began to see it happen now God had already made a plan for Elijah if God says you'll have no more rain and there will be a time when you'll be difficult to get food I've traveled to some places I can't mention them people get excited but I've traveled to some places in the Caribbean where you don't have to have anybody give you food there are fruits that spring up on their own 
In fact, they had to warn me. I was in one of those places conducting a meeting, and, and they told me, look on the ground. You see that right there? And I picked up something, and I pulled the thing off, and I chewed, and that was wonderful. I said, is this stuff everywhere? They said, everywhere, every day. And you can find something. So if anybody is hungry here, that means they don't know what to look for. Uh, there are some things that you can just find to eat, but when the water stops, when there's no more irrigation, then where do you eat? Well, since God told Elijah to send the message, he ought to take care of the messenger. Oh, every preacher ought to say amen on that one. If God sends you with a message, particularly one that is not well received, then God ought to have a plan for you when you finish putting the message forth. In fact, I suggest to you that he never is left without a plan. So anything God tells you to say, you can say with authority, because when you finish, God will sustain you. And so now God says, uh, Elijah, go to the brook Cherith. And when you get there, you will find pure water that won't dry up quickly. And I will make a special arrangement for food. I will give directions to ravens. And birds will bring you food. Can you imagine? Most of the time, birds seem like a nuisance. Many times, they do things that are not completely in consonance with your particular tastes. But when God tells a bird what to do, a bird can bring you breakfast and lunch and dinner and maybe even a snack in the afternoon. So here is Elijah who has predicted there'll be no more rain. And, and it was a terrible message. In fact, in the palace of Ahab and Jezebel, they said, find him. They did not believe that it was the God of heaven who had sent the message. So they blamed the messenger. Well, if you're going to ever talk for God, you've got to learn that some people will blame the messenger. That's why I'm glad God protects messengers. What do you say? So God says, go down by the brook Cherith, and when you get there, you'll find water. Perhaps Elijah thought for just a second, okay, water, fine. Anything else? And soon his answer came. A raven comes flying and stops in the right place and brings food, enough food to sustain him. You know, that, that had to be something. I, I kind of wish I had been there to see that. And so he eats a meal, and then the raven comes again. Whether it was the same or not, I wouldn't really care. I don't know whether I'd get to know him that well. I just want to know, do you have something with you? and the meals came. Now, here's what I want to suggest to you. It was God who said, go to the brook Cherith. When you follow what God says, you have no question in your mind. If you go at his bidding, he will empower you and he will sustain you. You're going to pick up a little rhythm in this in a minute. So if God says go, go knowing that everything will be handled by the power of the Almighty. So as long as he's there, the, the little stream doesn't dry up. Everywhere else is getting dry. There are trees that are beginning to look like skeletons. There are bushes that have nothing on them that's green. Flowers have disappeared. There are pieces of property that have nothing on them anymore. It almost looked like, looks like fire has come. They are completely burned away by the heat of the sun. And yet that little brook, the brook Cherith, still has water. And the ravens still arrive on time. Somebody ought to say amen for the power of God to sustain you when he directs you. Well, uh, there came a time when the brook Cherith dried up. I, I, I listen to uh, preachers on an eclectic basis. I, I enjoy when preachers preach with authority, and I've heard a preacher who says that when God shuts a door, he opens a window. If God ever allows one source to dry up, you can just look around because there will be another. God does not leave those who follow him without some way to be sustained. 
So when God says, look, you see your brook? And Elijah said, yeah, I don't see much brook left. Kind of dry. He said, I tell you what, go over to a place called Zarephath in the New Testament, Sarepta. And when you get there, you will find a widow and her son. I have already given her instructions. The woman was not a woman who, who considered herself part of the family of God. But I happen to know that God moves on people who are not necessarily in the family. I have seen God do miraculous things through people who didn't even claim to know who God was. But his power is so great that he can accomplish miracles through people who seem unlikely. That's what I like about being where God sends me. So he goes to this widow. I, I could get excited about this, so I've got to monitor myself. This woman is out with, uh, with her son. She has decided that this is the last day of nutrition. She looked in her meal barrel and saw only enough left for one more cake of bread. She looked in her oil cruise, and there was only enough oil left for one more cake of bread. Some of you don't understand because you have never been poor enough to be truly hungry. I grew up in a house where we knew the Lord, but every now and then the Lord would show us his power by letting things run out. I suggest to you that you really don't know God unless you've run out until you've been between a rock and a hard place, between the devil and the deep blue sea, at the end of your rope, down to your last dime. If you've never been without, you don't really know God. You are culturally deprived. Because the way you really come to know God is to run out. Uh, this woman had run out, and she says to her son, let's go gather enough to make a fire and we're going to come back and eat our last cake, and then we're going to die. And in the midst of that trauma comes a preacher with a plan. Plan doesn't sound great at the beginning. Preacher says, <laughs> and I wish you could contextualize this to your own situation. Sometimes we back away from the Word of God so we think everything to be normal. Here you are with your only son and you're getting ready to eat your last meal and a preacher shows up and said, would you do me a favor? Would you make that last cake for me? I'm giving you time. I'm giving you time. Because you can sound as holy as you want to in your head. But I'm going to tell you what you would say if that happened. You know, uh, sir, uh, I know you're a man of God and everything. Maybe you don't understand what I told you. I said, we're going to eat the last cake of meal we got. Did you say, could you have it? I don't think so. Some of you would never have seen the miracle because you don't have enough faith to do what that woman did. In fact, you got to forgive me. I get way into the story. And I, f I feel the, the heat rising from that son's head. You know, Mama, Mama, can I talk to you a minute? No, I, no, I won't come over. Come over here. No. You can uh, get that preacher our last food. Couldn't you split it? I, I try to be religious too, but mama, it's the last thing we got. I figured we had one more, and you're, gonna, you're not going to give it to him, Mike. She said, well, God has moved on my heart, and, and God is saying to me that I ought to take the chance, trusting not in the preacher, but in God. And, and so, yes, I'm going to make the last cake of meal we got. And I'm giving it to the preacher. I don't understand. You know, I wish I could be over there when you get it cooked, because I sure would break me a little piece off of it, I'll tell you that. <laughs> but she does it. <laughs> you know, forgive me, but I, I really enjoy the Bible. 
I, I, I wish I could have been places. And, and I'd like to have sat there with that mother and that son and watched that man eat that cake of bread. <laughs> Can you imagine what thoughts are going through your head? You know, because you know with that wind shifts, you can catch the aroma of that thing. And some things start happening physiologically that you can't control. You know, and you know, mama, it look good. You did a good job. It smells good, too. But that's the last one, right? You didn't make it? Oh, okay. You know what happened. After everything was gone, the man of God said, eventually, let's make another cake. Uh, sir, with all due respect, <laughs> uh, there was no more meal and there was no more oil. So what you suggest is preposterous. Why don't we just all band together and die with faith in God? He said, yeah, but you didn't hear me. Why don't you go check your meal barrel? Why don't you go check your oil crew? I wish they'd sent the boy because I like the, the fact of a young person learning firsthand what it is when you trust God when there seems like nothing. I wish young people could know. There wouldn't be so many teen suicides if young people could come to understand that if you obey what God says, if you just take God at his word, you will never run out of resources. I wish the young man had gone to check the meal barrel because I can hear him in there, hey, mama! And he checks in there and sees what he knows can't be and then goes to the cruise of oil and sees what can't be there. But God makes things happen like that on a regular basis. So now this woman and her son eat while the, the drought goes on and they eat with the man of God. Can you imagine that? If you have enough faith in God to expect the impossible, God will make the impossible happen, and it doesn't happen on a temporary basis. It happens for as long as you need it. I wish I had time to tell you that not only did God provide meal for them to make cakes of meal, but one day the sun died. And the man of God who otherwise would have left that house took the boy up to his place that was in a high part of the house and, and by the power of God resurrected that child. I tell you that if you obey God in small things, God will reward you in unbelievable things. All they were promised was food, but God gave them back life. Resurrection came because of their faith. I wish I had time to preach. So now we learn something else. If God says go to Zarephath, God will take care of you in Zarephath. I wish the widow could have been here tonight. She would have said, oh yeah. <laughs> in fact, that meal got to tasting better later on. The oil quality may have improved. I'm not sure, but it sure tasted like it. What must you think when you are eating food that does not exist? <laughs> oh, your brain isn't fast enough. You're supposed to respond quicker to that. But if God sends you to Zarephath, then you will be blessed at Zarephath. Now, God says, beginning chapter 18, uh, Elijah, it's time for you to go and tell him that I'm ready to make rain come. Here is what you must understand. The people of God, not the people in the street, the people who claim the God of heaven, the people who said that he was their sovereign, had come to believe in other gods. They came to believe that rain was caused when Baal, a, a god that had nothing to do with them. When Baal was resurrected, the rain came. And that's why the people worshiped Baal. And let me tell you something, God will get straight. God is jealous for his own name. 
fact, I want to give you a little free hint on how to get a prayer through. If you can ever convince God that his answering your prayer will bring glory to his name, your prayer has a great chance of being answered. So now, here is the question. God must convince his people that the power that brings rain is not from some strange God. It is from his own hand. It is God who causes the rain to fall. It is God who takes the water up from the bodies of water that are pulled up by the sun. They turn from one substance to another. They change into a gas and are pulled up into the air. And then God redistributes them and they come down in rain and the cycle goes over and over. It's called the hydrologic cycle. God didn't name it that. He just made it happen. Scientists named it. But it is God who takes up moisture and lets moisture come down to water the things that are in your fields, to water the crops. Praise God, some collard green somewhere is nurtured by moisture that comes from God. If you don't understand it, ask somebody tomorrow and they will explain it to you. So here is my question. Will God get glory for his name? Absolutely. Join us next time on Breath of Life for more of Pastor Pearson's message on Elijah. We all look at the Bible, and if we even believe in it, we say, ah, there wasn't much drama in that. Look, for three and a half years, Ahab and Jezebel have contacted all the nations within reach, and they have said to them, search your country for a man named Elijah. You'll be able to find him. He dresses funny, coarse garments. You'll know him also because he says amazing things. He, he's caught him with some, some power trip that we don't understand. We don't care if you like him or not. Find him, and we want him here. And every head of state had answered, we can't find him. Makes me wonder about some things that are happen happening concurrently. But I'll leave that alone. Now God says, go and show yourself to Ahab. Let me tell you something. You've got to have some faith now because the whole country is dry and parched. Some parents have lost their children because they can't feed them. Is the place stirred up? These people have complained to anyone who was in authority, and they say, what's happening? What's causing this? And Ahab's answer was, it's a strange-looking man named Elijah. They blamed him for it. And God says, now I want you to go to Ahab. Go show yourself to him and tell him that if we can work this thing out as I instruct you, there'll be rain. <laughs> so... You know, if you know God well enough, you're not afraid to go. I don't care how hard they've been looking for you. They're going up there in his face. Because if God be for you, <laughs> who could be against you? So are you afraid of Ahab? I don't think so. God has hidden you. Now he brings you out. So instead of running into uh, Ahab, Elijah runs into Obadiah, who is the governor of Ahab's house a man who believes in the God of heaven, who during the interim, when Jezebel went out to kill every prophet of the God of heaven she could find, this man hid a hundred of them in a cave by fifties. Now, you know, you got to have some serious relationship with God to disobey the man whose house you are governor over. But if God is in your heart, you get holy boldness. You don't, you don't get silly, you get bold. There is a difference. So he's still working in the house of Ahab and Jezebel, but he has hidden a hundred of the prophets of God. And now he runs into Elijah. Now, here's how this goes, and I know you don't think it ought to be traumatic, but what has happened is that every head of state that has answered back has said, we can't find him. 
we heard he was here, but when we go to look where they said he was, he's not there. <laughs> How many believe God can do that? Some of you in here worried about your enemies right now, what they're going to do to you. You know something, if God is with you, your enemies can't find you. They'll go where people said you were. <laughs> people are usually wrong anyway, so that's not a miracle. But even when you need a miracle, God can make you not be where they thought you were. So uh, Obadiah says, uh, whoa, how you doing? Uh, I'm doing fine. How about you? He said, uh, okay. He said, go tell Ahab I, I want to talk to him. Said, please, please, you know I respect you. You know you and I believe in the same God. But if I go tell him that I found you, after all the people he's contacted to find you, and then I come back with him and you are not here, Elijah, I'm going to be gone. You know, I've been playing a pretty, pretty decent balancing act living in the man's house, believing in the God that you and I know to be true, but I don't know whether I'm willing to take that risk. Why don't you go tell somebody else to go get Ahab for you? Elijah says, no, I'll stay right here. Bring him. I'm not going anywhere. Your life is not in danger. You can trust my word. So Obadiah goes and says, uh, Ahab, uh, uh, sir, uh, this is not an easy thing to say. I have found somebody you've been looking for. Who is it? Well, do you want to sit down, sir? Oh, sit down. Tell me who it is. It's Elijah. You have found Elijah? Sir, I did not find him. He found me. Remember, you were out searching for enough water to keep our, our livestock alive, and I was too. We split up at your instruction. I wish we had been together, because then I wouldn't be worried about this conversation, but he did not come to you. He came to me, and he told me to bring you to him. Incidentally, if you serve God, God will bring your enemies to you from time to time. When Ahab shows up, you know something, when you've been looking for somebody for a long time and you've been thinking about all the horrible things you're going to do to them, and then you run into somebody who knows the Most High God, and you recognize that you're not going to be able to do what you thought you could. In fact, the closer you get to them, the more of God's influence you feel, and you realize that I better be careful what I do because the power that's with him is greater than the power that is with me. I got soldiers, but he's got God. So all that stuff he said, you know, I'm sure he had some conversations with Jezebel and said, you wait till I find. When I first lay eyes on him, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cause his life to be miserable. But now that he comes into the presence of the man of God, all he can say is, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? <laughs> hey, guess what Elijah says? See, you folk, you got to understand that when God endorses your ministry, you don't have to back down. You don't have to walk around with hat in hand. You shouldn't be mean to people, but you don't have to go around acting as though you have no power. When you've got God on your side, you've got power. <laughs> look, look at this. Look at this. Here is a man with power. And so he says, you are the one. You and your father's house are the ones who brought the trouble on Israel. He said, I've come to uh, bring you a proposition from God. I'd like to, for you to get all of the prophets of Baal, 450 of them. I'd like for you to get the prophets who eat from your wife's table, 400 of them. I'd like for you to bring them with you to Mount Carmel. Bring two bullocks with you. And here is what I propose. Why don't we settle this thing about who is really God? It's time to stop halting between two opinions. You know what I think is wrong right now with most Christians? We halt between two opinions. We want to be with the Lord. We want to be on the side of Jesus. But every now and then when we get around powerful people, we want to kind of hobnob with them. 
So we talk like they want us to talk, and we stop calling on the name of God and try to use euphemisms. Let me tell you something. You got to make up your mind one day. Whose side are you on? Who is it that really has the power? And so he says, you tell them to bring the bullocks and we'll meet on Mount Carmel. And when they come, we will, we will make a decision. We will choose which bullock we want. Let them choose. I'll take the one they don't want. And on that day, when we go to make sacrifices, we will bring no fire. And the God who answers by fire will be God. Ahab said, hey, no problem. No problem. I got 850 religious people. You think they can't make fire? Now they go to Carmel. Now let me tell you something. You remember the same God who told him to go to, to the palace of Ahab and Jezebel? And he was fine because God sent him. The brook Cherith, fine, God sent him. Zarephath, fine, God sent him. Carmel. I don't worry about this. God told him what to do. And if you take God's plan, you're fine. So there was never any doubt in this prophet's mind because he knew that if God sends you, it's done. It's done. You don't understand what I'm saying. There's somebody worried about tuition. Well, if you're not on God's side, keep worrying. Keep worrying. Somebody's worried about what the economy is going to do to my parents and how will they do. If, if you're not on God's side, keep worrying because nobody can allay your fears except the God of heaven and he can make all things right. So, so this, this prophet walks up to Carmel and tells him, why don't you go first because there's more of you. <laughs> and 850 religious people along with thousands who represent Israel. They are there when, when Elijah says, choose ye this day whom you'll serve. And when he puts the question to them, all those religious people, now see some folk don't think about that, but all those people had claimed that they were children of Abraham that they were God's children. They were children of God Jehovah. And yet when Elijah puts the question, he can't get an answer. Like some folk in churches. I'm not saying everybody's got to be saying amen at the top of your voice, but when you hear some truth, you ought to at least respond in some way to truth. But he says, whom will you serve? And the people said not a word. If there's one thing that God hates, it is neutrality. People who don't believe in anything. And if you don't believe in anything, you are liable to fall for anything. So, so the people are quiet. And then they start. And uh, you, you've heard about it. You've heard preachers uh, go on and on about all the practices of these religious folk, how they... Uh, they were somewhat loud in their remonstrations and how they cut themselves eventually because they were calling on Baal. They wanted him to show himself, bring fire down. I happen to know from one of my favorite writers that the prince of the power of the air was there and he tried his best to get some lightning on Mount Carmel. But when Satan was there with his prince, Le Power, God was there with all of his angels and they would not let the lightning come down. It might have come down low, but it could not touch Carmel because God was not about to allow Satan to mess up this day. This was a day of choice. And incidentally, Elijah was watching too. Some folk think because you pray, you don't have to watch. You know, Elijah, hey, 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 what you doing over there? Well, I just had these two little rocks, you know, and I, I was just, you know, seeing what would happen if I would kind of rub them like, put the rocks down. Your God needs your help with little rocks? I thought your God was powerful. Tell Baal to bring the fire. Put the rocks down. Well, I didn't know you were looking. I'm looking. <laughs> I'm praying, but I'm watching. And 
all day long. They got to noon, and then Elijah starts doing something that most people think is, is really out of place. You know, some religious people don't have a sense of humor at all. And, and I don't want to hurt your feelings, but what is wrong with you? When, when you're happy and you know it, when you got Jesus' joy in your heart, uh, when, when you look at the fruit of the Spirit, love, the first thing that happens after love is joy. So if you don't have any joy, I'm wondering if you got any spirit. That's joy in your heart. Elijah was up there confident, so when they couldn't get their God to come, he said, maybe he's traveling. Maybe he's hunting. You know? Maybe you need to call a little louder because he may have gone on some trip. Or maybe he's sleeping. My God doesn't sleep. He never sleeps. He never slumbers. But your God may be asleep. Why don't you call him a little louder? And for the rest of the day until the time of the evening sacrifice, those people did everything that you have read about. I do not disparage them because I do not poke fun at other people's religious practices. I'm not, I, don't, I, don't, I don't poke fun at that. You do whatever you think you should do within the context of your belief system. But then when it came time for Elijah, he said, you know, calm down. Here's what I want to do. The folk been tearing down the, the, the place where we sacrifice to our God, so let's start off by putting the stones back where they ought to be. Twelve stones for the sons of Jacob. Put them back in place. Then put the board there. And let's cut the, the offering, the bullet. Let's cut it as it ought to be cut. But then I want you to do a little something extra because God is about to show himself. Does anybody know that, who knows that God can show up? Yes, sir. That's right. And when he shows up, there is no question. Yes, so he said, I tell you what, bring uh, four barrels of water in that trench I told you to dig and just pour it in there. In fact, go get another load. Bring, make it eight. Go get another load. Make it 12. They stand around and say, you know, this man right here, I don't know what he believes in. And without any kind of, of strange reaction at all, he simply turns his eyes heavenward. God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, if I'm your servant and if I've done what you told me to do, then send fire. Forgive me, I'm just trying to calm myself down. Fire did not erupt on the ground. That would have been suspicious. Fire rained down from as high as you could see in the sky, like lightning falling at first. Then like the pillar of cloud that followed Israel at night in the wilderness. And the strange thing that I've learned about the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire is that at night when the pillar of fire separated between God's people, the Israelites, and the Egyptians, it was so high that it looked like it reached all the way up to heaven and nobody was about to come around it. It was too wide. Nobody was trying to come through it and they knew from whence it came. It was not ordinary fire. And when those folk looked up, and God made it so that the fire poured down from heaven and came down and burned up the bullock, burned up the wood, burned up the stones, licked up the dust, and the water evanesced. There was nothing left. And even the prophets of Baal bowed down. The Bible says there will come a day when every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. Now, I got to tell you this fast because this, amazingly, is what I came to preach about. <laughs> God said, go to the palace. God said, go to the brook Cherith. God said, go to Zarephath. God said, go back to the palace. 
meet him wherever he is. God said, go to Carmel. But now even Elijah finds himself going where God has not sent him. When, when that thing happened, they went down and killed all the prophets of Baal and all the prophets that ate at the table of Jezebel. And, and you would have thought that that would have meant revival because all those religious people who served strange gods were now dead. Then Elijah says, look, go tell Elijah to, go, go tell Ahab to eat because we can ready to come down from here because God said rain is coming. The servant goes out and tries to see anything happening. There are no clouds. The, the man of God has his head between his knees. He's praying. He says, go back, go back. He goes back six times. Nothing. The number seven, however, has, has the ability of representing perfection. When he went out the seventh time, he came back and said, Elijah, I see some little cloud like a size of a man's hand. He said, I'm going down to tell Ahab. I'm getting ready to guide him home now because if you see that, God is about to send rain. He goes and tells Ahab, I'm going to take you home. Strange thing, isn't it? When you stand for God, you don't have to be mean to people. He gets in front of his chariot and the rain starts coming. Somebody say amen for the rain. The rain falls in torrents. He takes this king back to Jezreel to his home and is content to sleep outside in the rain. If you've been predicting rain by the power of God, the best thing for you to feel on your body is rain that God sent. So in the rain he sleeps. And I'm sure the man of God thought it's going to be wonderful. When Jezebel hears about this, she's going to turn. Her heart will melt. And I don't want to talk about women in a negative fashion in this story because there are some men also for whom nothing is enough. Ahab goes inside and says, hey, Jezebel, you ain't going to believe. Woo, I wish I had been there today. What happened? Well, first thing happened was, you know, I told you about this thing about the bullocks and we did all that stuff. And, and you know, your prophet, they were good. I got, I got to give them to them. They did a good job. You would have you liked them. Even those 400 who eat from your table, they did the best they could. I'm telling you. I watched them all day long. Those guys gave their all. <laughs> but something went wrong, Jezebel, and no, no fire came. Then that one man out there by himself called on his God and fire rained down out of heaven and you could see where it started well not quite where it started but you could see it come all the way down and it and it ate up the sacrifice and ate up the wood and ate up the stones and ate up the water and then it licked up the dust girl you should have been out there she said and you excited about that yeah well you had to be there and so what happened was after that happened all your priests bowed down they did what uh Oh, I, yeah, they bowed down. And all your prophets bowed down. And at that point, all of us thought it was right to kill them. <laughs> you know, some may have, sometimes I worry about you. They did what? Well, they, they killed her. They gone. Killed every one of them. I, you know, I just wish you had been there because I think if you had been there, you'd have been in agreement with it. Oh, you think so? Well, I tell you what, can you get me a messenger? Could you call me somebody? Where is Elijah now? Well, I don't know. He, he led me down here and, you know, I rode on into the property and that's the last I saw him. I don't know what he's doing. Bring me a messenger. You go tell that man, and this is a transliteration now, just as sure as he is Elijah and I am Jezebel, he will be just like my prophets by tomorrow this time. Now, let me talk fast, but I got to talk straight. Do you know what the problem is? There are some of us who think that when a miraculous thing happens, that's the end. It's all of, I went the week of prayer. I'm changed. It's gone now. We're not... I'm not going to ever have any more problems. I could feel all my burdens floating away. <laughs> Some of us have been around long enough to know that it is right after your greatest triumphs when your greatest trials come. 
God has not promised until the end to take away all of Satan's power. He will leave Satan with the power. The only thing that we need to know is greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. If you got greater power, then you can deal, right? So this prophet with all of that courage for the first time goes somewhere that God didn't send him. He even came to Jezreel when God said come. But now he heads to Beersheba because he's scared. The voice of Jezebel scared him. Elijah goes to sleep and something touches him, somebody. It's an angel. The angel says, wake up. I got food for you. And there it is over there. It's cooked. Get up and eat. Goes back to sleep. He's awakened the second time. Go eat because you got a long journey. Now listen to this. This is what you must understand. Elijah is now going where God has not sent him. In fact, he is going away from where he's supposed to be. And the God some of us believe in would have said, I'm not going to help him. You're on your own. But I'm telling you that God loves us so much that he pursues us even when we're going where he did not send us. And when he finally got to that place, God asked him a question. What are you doing here? I sent you to all those other places, but I didn't send you here. And here is my question. What is God doing there? If I'm running from God, what kind of God would go with me? There are some of you listening to me right now and you are convinced that because of things you have done in your past that God has forsaken you. And I tell you on the basis of what is written in the Word of God that even when you run the wrong way, God will not cut you off from Him. His love extends even to those who are running where He never sent them. And so in that place, there is first a wind then an earthquake, then a fire. But what God is trying to show this prophet is that even when my answers do not, don't make loud noises, sometimes I'm answering your prayer in a still, small voice. Even when in your life you don't have a Spielberg moment, even when no furniture moves and no wind blows in your house, even when there's nothing that you can go tell your neighbors, you should have been in my house the other night, I felt something. Listen, if God promises you something, you don't have to feel anything in your house. You can take him at his word. So tonight, my admonition to you is this. I don't care where you've run. I don't care how many times you've gone without the power of God with you, you thought. God loves you so much that he'll follow you where you run and give you power in that very place. God bless you. Join us next time for more Breath of Life with Pastor Walter L. Pearson, Jr. Walter Pearson believes that Jesus Christ is the answer to every problem you face.